Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I invite you to open up God's Word with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, today. We continue a new section of John, a new series that we have titled The Great I Am, as we journey now through John 5 through 12. The Great I Am. In this section of Scripture, Jesus demonstrates that He is the unique and divine Son of God. And today, as we consider John 5, verses 19 through 29, I've titled the message, Like Father, Like Son. Like Father, Like Son, because this passage gives us some glorious insight into the relationship between the Heavenly Father and the Heavenly Son. And it also gives us some light into the unique power of Jesus. See, as we've been following along in the gospel of John up till this point, perhaps we would wonder, how is it that a man could say to Nicodemus, whoever believes in me will have eternal life? How is it that a man could say to the Samaritan woman, whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again? How is it that a man could heal a feverish boy from 20 miles away? How is it that a man could restore strength to a man who had been an invalid for 38 years? Well, this passage will give us insight into the unique standing and power of the Son of Man, who is the Son of God. And first of all, our text instructs us to honor this Son because he is one with the Father. That's point number one today, as we consider verses 19 through 23. Honor the Son, because he is one with the Father. Now, the passage that we consider today is in connection with the passage we last considered. It's been two weeks now, in the beginning of John chapter 5. You recall the story there at the beginning of this chapter, where Jesus stepped into or beside the pool of Bethesda, where there were a multitude of invalids gathered waiting for healing. And Jesus, in his divine initiative, stepped right up to a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years years said, do you want to be healed? The man said, of course, I'd love to be healed. And I'm waiting for what I believe will bring healing. But Jesus in his grace and power said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And that man was granted healing instantly. But that passage goes on to show us that Jesus got in trouble for this, got in trouble because it was the Sabbath day. And he ended up encountering the Jewish religious leaders who accused him of breaking the Sabbath. And there were a number of reasons we talked about why Jesus was engaging with the Sabbath in unexpected ways. But the ultimate reason is because Jesus was no mere man. And our passage last time concluded, verses 17 and 18, notice just by way of review, Jesus answered them, my father, not our father, my father, the one I have a unique relationship with, he is working until now, and I am working. What was the response? Verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so the verses that we consider today is a further explanation of Jesus' words. He explains to anyone who will have ears to hear that, yes, I am equal with God, but I am not a second God in competition with the Jewish God or independent from him. Far from it. Notice Jesus says in verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. The son does only what he sees the father doing, like father, like son. And in essence, Jesus is saying to his critics, if you don't like what I'm doing, if you don't like what I'm saying, then you don't like God. 
Notice verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Imagine all those years in his earthly life from a very young age, Jesus apprenticing his adoptive father, Joseph, in that carpenter shop, learning the trade, first observing and then participating, learning all the finer details of carpentry as he apprenticed his adoptive father. But now cast your mind back to eternity past. For all eternity, Jesus has been apprenticing, so to speak, his heavenly father. Perhaps this would shed light upon passages such as Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. We get a glimpse into that Trinitarian dynamic. And unless we understand the dynamic of the triune God, though, this verse in isolation may be misleading. We may read these words of Jesus in verses 19 and 20 and wonder, do these words make the Son inferior to God the Father? For example, in verse 19, when it says he does nothing of his own accord, does that call into question his omnipotence? When he says in verse 20 that the father shows him, does that call into question the son's omniscient? Well, the answer must be no. The son has always been fully God with every divine attribute to the fullest extent. In fact, Don Carson points out that even from this verse, we see that the only one who could do whatever the father does must be as great as the father, must be as divine as the father. Amen? But this verse does draw us to consider the totality of Scripture's revelation on the triune God. And I want to just take a moment to review this all-important doctrine. We'll put a summary up here on the screen for you. There is one God, amen? One God. And Scripture tells us that this one God eternally exists as three divine persons. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. These three are one in essence and equal in glory, but they are distinct in function. It's a very important thing for us to understand. Wayne Grudem explains, every person is fully God and has all the attributes of God. The only distinctions between these members of the Trinity are in the ways they relate to each other and to creation. And in those relationships, they carry out roles, functions that are appropriate to each person. You say, well, Pastor Mike, what are these functions within the workings of the divine trinity? I'm so glad you asked. The revelation of scripture leads us to understand that it is the father's role to plan and direct. It is the son's role primarily to act out that plan and direction. And it is the spirit's role to bring to completion and beautify what the father has planned and directed and what the son has acted out. Let me give you just a few notable examples from the storyline of scripture. Creation. This was the father's plan. It was the Father's directive, but we come to understand in Hebrews 1 and Colossians 1 and John 1 that it was God the Son who in fact acted out creation, who was the divine agent of creation, bringing all things into existence. And then we also find out in Scripture that it is the Holy Spirit who brings to completion, who beautifies, even to this day, who beautifies creation, causing the flowers to flower and the rain to fall and the animals to be nourished and a thousand other things. Take redemption, for example. Our salvation, the thing that you and I, our eternal standing depends upon, the salvation of our souls from sin. This was the Father's plan and direction, but we know it was the Son who was sent to act this 
out, to live the perfect life that you and I have failed to live, to die on the cross in our place, to rise from the grave so that all who believe may have eternal life. And it is the Spirit who brings that to completion, so to speak, because were it not for the Spirit's work, that wonderful thing that Jesus did 2,000 years ago, we would never know about. We would never be awakened from our deadness in sin to receive it and to walk in it. It is the Spirit who brings that work of salvation to our lives individually. What a wonderful thing this is. I know these can be some deep topics right now, and some of you are like, my brain is just not quite awake enough to fully grasp this. Well, my friend, we will never fully grasp these amazing, profound truths of the Trinity, but what a joy it is to receive what Scripture reveals. And it is important to have this context as we come to this text, understanding that as we consider verse 19 and 20, we should by no means read into these verses that Jesus, God the Son, is inferior to God the Father. This is a very important thing for us to affirm. I mean, we we don't believe that in their being, a son is inferior to a father, do we? Of course we don't believe that, but we do see a distinction in roles, and that's what this passage emphasizes. We see the Father initiating and leading, and we see the Son responding and obeying. Jesus says even more plainly later in John 14, 31, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. This is a profound thing. And it is a unique relationship, however, it is meant to be instructive to us as well. Because if even Jesus, God the Son, with every divine attribute to the fullest extent, if even Jesus was willing to follow his heavenly Father, none of us should be unwilling to follow the leaders in our lives. If you want to be like Jesus, one way to be like Jesus is to follow your leaders. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Church members, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Citizens, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether emperor or governor. All Christians, if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. Scripture over and over calls us to follow our leaders, and this is a calling which even Jesus did not exempt himself from. You say, well, Pastor Mike, this is difficult because human leaders can be corrupt. This is true. And this is tragic, and I have experienced it. I know how difficult those dynamics can be. And I'm thankful that God provides recourse for when leaders are truly oppressive. But here's the thing, my friends. The potential misuse of leadership does not negate its use. And the fact is that God in his good design has built structure into human relationships, has he not? And even Jesus, fully God, was willing to obey his father. You are like God the son when you obey. And conversely, leaders... You are like God the Father when you lead lovingly. Don't miss this mention here in verse 20. Notice it again. The Father loves the Son. His leadership is not selfish. It is not cold-hearted. And again, that is to be an example to us. Husbands, love your wives. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. The father loves the son. And notice again here in verse 20, how the father's love is demonstrated by showing the son all that he himself is 
doing. Now, again, I don't want to take away from the very unique nature of the Trinitarian relationships. However, again, we are to look to God as our example, right? And God the Father is a wonderful example of a father in showing the Son all that he himself is doing. Fathers, this is a great way for us to love our children. Invite them into your life. As they grow in their capacity to understand, show them what you're doing. Be an example to them. Be a teacher to them. Study after study after study is revealing the plight of fatherlessness in the world around us and its tragic effects and consequences. Is this true? Fathers, you and I have an opportunity to follow the example of the ultimate father in inviting our children into our lives in an intentional way. Oh, these scriptures are so rich with meaning for us. Let's continue on here. As verse 20 continues, Jesus says, greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Once again, let's remember the context here into which Jesus is speaking. He's essentially saying, hey, Jewish leadership, you're worked up about a healing? You ain't seen nothing yet. Greater works will you see. Just wait until you see me raise a man from the dead. Then you'll be impressed. Just wait until you see me give spiritual life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. Then you will marvel. Might we marvel at this life-giving power of the Son? But even as we appreciate his life-giving power, notice in this text that repeatedly life and judgment are linked side by side. And this is the case as we move from verse 21 to 22. Notice now, the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. See, these Jewish leaders knew their Bibles very well. They knew, for example, Genesis 18, 25, which says God is the judge of all the earth. But here we are able to zoom in on a Trinitarian detail and see that the Father works through the Son, that he has delegated this task of judgment to the Son. And you may want to write down this cross-reference, Acts 17, 31, which states plainly that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. This is good news for us, is it not? There is so much that is wrong in our world. There is so much brokenness and wickedness and defiance of the Lord, but there is coming a reckoning. There is coming a day, the day is fixed, when we will see heaven opened and behold a white horse, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness. He judges and makes war on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19. And the result of this judgment will be, notice verse 23, will be that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And conversely, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Again, keep the context in mind and the individuals to which Jesus was speaking. These Jewish leaders knew the Old Testament scripture and knew that there was an honor, a glory that is reserved for God alone. For example, Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am Yahweh, that is my name and my glory I give to no other. But Jesus was not an other. He too is Yahweh, like father, like son. Honor the father and honor the son. And to honor the son is to honor the father. 
when at the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, it is to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2. And this is a sobering word and a warning that to dishonor the Son is to dishonor the Father. This has tremendous relevance to so many religions. For example, unbelieving Jews who do not accept Jesus as their Messiah dishonor God the Father who sent him. Muslims dishonor God by relegating his son to the status of being merely a prophet. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses dishonor God by saying that the son is less than eternal, less than fully God. Mystic spiritualism is not truly interested in the divine if it is not interested in the divine son. You honor the father when you honor the son. But to honor the son is a joy and a privilege. It is one of the highest callings and glories of the Christian life. You cannot honor him too highly. He is worthy of the highest praise that we can give. I love a wonderful quote that we heard at last weekend's conference by an ancient church father named Gregory of Nazianzus, exalting Jesus, the unique son of God and son of man. He He wrote that Jesus hungered, but he fed thousands. He thirsted, but he cried, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He was wearied, but he is the rest of them that are weary and heavy laden. He prays, but he hears prayer. He weeps, but he causes tears to cease. He asks where Lazarus was laid, for he was man, but he raises Lazarus, for he was God. He was sold for a cheap 30 pieces of silver, but he redeems the world at the great price of his own blood. As a sheep, he is led to the slaughter, but he is the shepherd of Israel and now of the whole world. As a lamb, he is silent, yet he is the word. He is bruised and wounded, but he heals every disease and every infirmity. He is lifted up and naked Nailed to the tree, but by the tree of life, he restores us. He dies, but he gives life, and by his death, destroys death. He is buried, but he rises again. It is impossible to give the Son of God too much praise and honor. He is worthy of it all. Let us honor the Son who is one with the Father. And moving on now in our text to point number two, let us also hear the Son because eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake based upon whether you hear the Son of God and respond to what you hear. There are many topics in our day, issues that are quite urgent, are they not? Many matters that surround us and we feel the urgency of them and we thank God, by the way, that his word speaks with timeless relevance to every urgent issue of our day and draws us forth to be salt and light in this world, to engage with these urgent topics. This was one of the primary reasons for the conference that took place last weekend. Those of you who were able to attend, I hope you could see clearly the relevance relevance of God's word to every urgent topic of our day. And if you weren't able to attend, we're going to have those recordings available for you very shortly here. And I encourage you all to tune in and be instructed on what God says about all the urgent matters surrounding us in this world. But having said that, may we never forget that there is one topic that is of supreme urgency. 
There is one topic that makes all other urgent topics pale in comparison. There is one question that will be relevant for you and I 100 years from now when all of those urgent topics of our day are but a distant memory. And that is the question, how will you respond to Jesus? Your response to Jesus is of eternal significance. So may we hear him well. Notice verse 24 as Jesus continues. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. Notice again the contrast. He does not come into what? Judgment, but has passed from death to what? Life. Don't miss the weight of those words. Hear this Well, see, we humans in our frailty, we sometimes have a hard time processing the things that we're hearing, or maybe it's just me. I will confess to you, and I don't like that this is true of me. This is just an honest confession. I can be in a conversation with somebody and may have every genuine intent of listening and in taking every word of what they say, but sometimes, to be honest with you, my mind begins to wander. There are things on my mind and on my heart and I'm distracted into pondering those things, even as it may look like I'm listening to that conversation partner. And then perhaps after 20 seconds, 30 seconds, I realize, whoa, my mind has been wandering here. I need to tune back in. And I'm thinking, I hope this person doesn't ask a question on the basis of what they have just said, because I can't be accountable for those words that I didn't actually hear. Oh, my friend, we cannot afford to miss Jesus' words here. Don't let your mind wander. Don't let the enemy snatch this word away from your heart the instant that it falls. Eternal life can be yours. But only if you hear the Son of God and believe. See, Jesus took the judgment on the cross so we don't have to bear it if you believe. Jesus rose from the grave so that you and I can have eternal life if you believe. The divine son of God died and rose so that you can become a child of God if you receive him, if you believe in his name. So thankful to the Lord. I give him all the honor and glory that his words of power penetrated into my heart. One day, a few decades ago, I was about five years old and I was so privileged to grow up in a house where my mother and father were continually speaking to me the words of scripture and the words of the gospel and exalting Jesus as the only way of salvation. And there came a day in my young life when I was able to begin to grasp these truths and to realize that these were truths to not only hear about, but truths that I must believe for myself. So I remember very well in the hallway of the home in Waterford where I grew up having a conversation with my mom about these things. And she urged me to believe these things for myself. And I did. And my story since that point has been a testimony to the mercy and grace and power of God who passed me from spiritual death into spiritual life. Is this your testimony? If not, don't miss out on this. Jesus is granting eternal life to those who are spiritually dead. Don't miss out. Verse 25, he continues, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead, the spiritually dead, will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. See, the 
truth is, my friend, that all of us entered this world spiritually stillborn, dead in trespasses and sins in which we walked. But the voice of the Son of God has a reviving power that no defibrillator could ever dream of. He said to that invalid by the pool, get up and walk. And that voice had power. And today, may he say to someone here, someone spiritually paralyzed, spiritually dead, get up and walk. That voice has power and those who hear will live, live eternally. This is the unique power of the Son of God. Notice verse 26, we see the explanation for this power. Verse 26, he says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself. Again, let us understand that these Jewish leaders with which he was conversing knew For example, Genesis 2, verse 7, which says that Yahweh God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. They knew God the Father could do this, and now Jesus says, I can do that too. Now, let's pause for a moment here and appreciate the fact that this is not the kind of thing that a sane human being says unless he is more than a mere human being. I'm sure many of you have heard the famous quote from C.S. Lewis. I think this is a good place to repeat it. He wrote, people often say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he was a madman or something worse. So you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to him with any patronizing nonsense about his being merely a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. You can call him a lunatic, you can call him a liar, or you can call him Lord. But whatever you call him, your response to his claims determines whether he will be your savior or your judge. See, that day of judgment is coming. It is unavoidable. You and I, each one of us, will stand before Jesus, ready or not. And your response to his words now determines your standing then. You students know how it is at the beginning of a semester. You receive your syllabus. You look over all the assignments and all the projects, and then your eye goes all the way down to the bottom of the page. Final exam. The day is set. The hour is fixed. And you know that in the intervening months, you've got some listening to do. You've got some reading to do. You've got some research and writing to do because that day is coming. And what you do now will determine your standing then. And if you do not plan and prepare now, you will be in bad shape when that hour comes. And you and I will be in very bad shape when the hour of judgment comes if we have not responded to the words of the Son now in this moment. Once again, verse 27 reminds us of how Jesus has this authority. Verse 27 says the Father has given the Son authority to execute judgment. Why? 
Well, this is an interesting little phrase because he is the son of man. Now, we saw already in verse 25, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of God. Here he uses the term Son of Man. And I believe this is very intentional in connection with future judgment based on an Old Testament scripture that, once again, these Jewish leaders would have known, the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And I'd like for us to see this for ourselves. If you would hold your place in John chapter 5, we'll return in just a moment. But turn to Daniel chapter 7, a profound and glorious passage which gives us some insight into the delegation of the authority of God to one who is called the Son of Man. Daniel is one of the prophets. Daniel chapter 7. And let's begin reading in Daniel 7 beginning in verse 9. The prophet gives us some insight into his vision. He says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Hey, we we just sang about that, didn't we? The Ancient of Days. Here we're given a glorious picture into the splendor and majesty of God Almighty. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in what? judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. This is a picture of sovereign cosmic judgment. Now notice verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like what? A son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the connection between cosmic judgment and the one called the Son of Man. And oh, by the way, while we're here in Daniel, would you turn just for a moment to Daniel chapter 12? Daniel chapter 12. And just look at one verse here that I believe Jesus also had in mind as he spoke those words in John 5. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 says that many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Keep these words in mind as you turn back now to John chapter 5. As Jesus continues now in John chapter 5, verse 28, he says, do not marvel at this. This was all written about ahead of time. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, I know that we Protestants who believe in salvation by grace alone through faith alone we may look at these words and go, whoa, hold on, hold on. Those who have done good are resurrected to life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Pastor Mike, is Jesus here teaching works salvation? Well, I don't believe he is. 
For one, right within our own context, back in verse 24, we are told that hearing God's word and believing in God is the only basis of eternal life. Amen? However, this is a reminder for us to keep in mind the two truths that stand side by side throughout the New Testament. One, that salvation is indeed based on grace alone, appropriated through faith alone. Amen? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. But there is another truth that stands alongside, and that is that this salvation will have a transforming effect on the life of the believer. The very next verse in Ephesians 2, verse 10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And just think about this logically, my friends. You cannot have a genuine encounter with the true and living God. You cannot be born again. You cannot be given the Holy Spirit without that making some impact in your life. Amen? It's impossible. This is why Jesus said a tree is known by its fruit. And those who are God's people bear the fruit of godly works. And Jesus, who is the judge of all, knows all. And please bear in mind, anyone who may be tempted into external moralism or self-effort, self-righteousness, please know that Jesus the judge is not fooled by false righteousness. He is not fooled by pleasant deeds and religious ceremonies that are powered by pride and self-righteousness. Nor is he fooled by those who staple fake paper mache fruit onto the tree. He's not fooled by that. Mere external morality is not the good of which this verse speaks. Nor is Jesus the judge fooled by a false profession of faith. He is not fooled by the person who claims the name of Christ with no sincere trust, without a hint of love for God, without an inkling of a desire to grow in him, with zero evidence of Holy Spirit fruit. He's not fooled by that. Genuine conversion will lead to genuine fruit. And so, as verse 28 says, an hour is coming when that fruit will be clear, when those characteristics of those who are redeemed by God's grace will be clear. The hour is coming, the day is fixed, when Jesus the judge will speak forth his summons. And notice this powerful language here in our text, verse 28. Every single person who has ever lived, all who are in the tombs, will respond. The bodies that have been peaceably laid in cemeteries, the bodies carelessly stacked in mass graves, the bodies scattered by explosion, the bodies sunk to the bottom of the deepest ocean. Every body will come out, verse 29, but not every body will end up in the same destination. There are two possibilities, the resurrection of life or the resurrection of judgment meaning that there are really only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are headed toward eternal life and those who are headed toward eternal judgment. Don't be fooled by all the ways that our world tries to categorize people falsely. There are only two kinds of people in this world. And the difference is their response to Jesus. And may the Lord give us eyes to see and hearts to feel the urgency of this. 
Once again, I want to quote C.S. Lewis. He says, remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to today will one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror in corruption such as you now meet only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And the only difference is their response to the words of Jesus. Christian friend, may this compel you and I to proclaim to all those around us, hear these words of the Son of God. Eternity is at stake. There is no higher priority.